even in their extreme states. You get some sense of, of what they're feeling, well, what they've the, been through, the, their emotions, and, and how, they're, how they're dealing with it. Absolutely. I was just doing a little bit of work, just to, mm. to think about portraits in the past of people disfigured, because it's not something you associate with portraiture, of many. course not. I mean, this is a very well-known painting by Quentin Massey, was it, early 1500s. And, and, you know, what is going on there? I mean, the, the, the belief was that this was a piece of satire of a very old, ugly woman trying to look young and rather curvaceous. It's a condition. Paget's disease. Correct. Paget's disease, which is a bone deformity, isn't it? What I love about it is that, the, although she's not looking at us, you get the sense of quite a proud, defiant person, don't you? You do. I'll tell you one that, that I've grown up with. Um, this gill and I here, oh, because yeah. my, my grandpa had this on his wart, and as a child I was always... I, well, I just didn't really understand why did my grandfather have this chap with all the warts on his nose, and I never really liked it. It was mm. only when I grew older and I had children of my mm. own mm -hmm. that I began to see what it's all about, which, of course, is this unquestioning devotion of the child, seeing past the warts on the nose, not caring about any of that. And the wonderful depth in the old man's face of wonderful appreciation of this admiring, this unconditional positive regard. It's beautiful. Simon's recovery from his physical injuries was just the beginning. The psychological scars went much deeper. Your examination by the board has now been completed. The board find that you are unfit for further military service. That's the first time I can remember feeling really low, at the point where, my goodness, what have I got? In my physical side of my life, as far as taking part in sport, being a very physical person, which I'd always been, was gone. And so I was going to have to use my brain, which scared the living heck out of me. I never thought that I would, I'd ever have to sort of make my living using my brain. Um, I was far happier just using the brawn. They can't keep me in. Simple as that. I just want a job. There's three million people who want a job too, Sam. So. <laughs> three million and one then, wouldn't they? I didn't know where we were going to turn. I didn't know... Where do you go from that? And the army had been his life and... I mean, he'd not only lost his friends, he was a great rugby player, prop forward. And to nothing, absolutely, and to a village. I didn't see any future. I struggled, and it's not like me. And I just didn't see that I'd have a relationship again. Mine had broken up and gone. I couldn't ever imagine anybody wanting to be with me the way I looked at that point in time. And, you know, and I still had sores, and it, you know, it couldn't have smelled great as well. You know, so it was, it was very hard to see the positives. Probably helped me and made it easier for me to drink a lot. He'd go down the club which was a bone of contention with me. I didn't like uh, him going down there. And I was appalled by it, absolutely appalled. It was pretty awful. What happened was when the operation stopped, he had time to think. And then he thought about all of his friends that had died and he felt that he should have died with them, that he shouldn't have lived. And, you know, he'd come in to me at 2 o'clock in the morning and he'd be crying and uh, say, Mum, you know, I shouldn't be here. Uh, yeah. And you'd be fast asleep and you'd wake up and think, what is going on, you know? It was a difficult time, a very difficult time, uh, when I would never want to go back visit again. It was very hard to see the positives. Um, I mean, what, what was your lowest moment, would you say? When I almost took my life, I suppose. 
I'm, I'm sensing you don't want me to say what, what you actually did. Oh, I, I, I don't mind that. I mean, it's, I tried to cock a crossbow. So you, you, you basically tried to shoot yourself? Yeah. In, in, the, in the head with the yeah, crossbow? Yeah, in the crossbow, yeah. And what stopped you? Um, my tips weren't strong enough to pull it. Um, when it ripped it out, it, it left blood pouring out the tips of my fingers. It was the, the pain that snapped me back into reality. And I thought, what an insult to all those incredible people that still do an incredible job. The people that kept you alive? Yeah, yeah, all of those people. Simon turned a corner and began to rebuild his life through sheer force of will. But it wasn't easy. I'm meeting psychologist Nicola Rumsey, who specialises in facial disfigurement, to find out more about the battles he faced. How difficult is it for someone who has had uh, facial disfigurement, who has facial scarring, in terms of recovering from that mm. and, and, and relating to the outside world? Well, the face is the, the prime way we communicate with others. Now, I want you to go... E if you have a change to your face, you've got to deal with the reactions of other people to you when you look different from the norm. And then the other side of it is that the face is also a very strong part of our identity. So, you know, we get up in the morning, we look at ourselves in the mirror, we decide whether or not we're having a good or a bad day. And if you look different, it doesn't feel like you, and it takes quite a long time to kind of incorporate that new look into your identity. <laughs> The thing that always strikes me about people that deal well with a disfigurement is the amount of energy they have to put into that coping process. So you've got to manage yourself and you've got to manage the discomfort or the embarrassment that other people are going through. So, you know, there have to come moments when you just want downtime and you, you just want, you know, to kind of drift into a nice anonymous place. If he does have moments, they're in the night, they're in the dark, because sometimes he'll say he doesn't sleep and he'll go down and sleep on the set. He, I never question what it's about, because I think I got a pretty good idea that, um, yes, I, I, I think that he, he loses it sometimes, you know, he's not as positive. I don't sleep terribly well anymore. Why is that? I don't know. I do think too much. I don't think back to the, the ship. Um, that you stopped. Have nightmares about that. I used to. I used to. I had PTSD for about twenty-four years. Post-traumatic <clears throat> stress disorder. Yeah, I had that for about twenty-four years. Gosh, that is a long time. I didn't realise how disruptive it was until I was out of it. It was like somebody cut a big elastic band off my chest. I could breathe deeply. I could suck in air, and and it felt good. Oh, this referee is an absolute joke. Though his injuries forced him to watch rather than play rugby, Simon has never lost his love of the game, particularly his beloved Clinetley Scarlets. He seems to just want to enjoy what he's got now and the person he is now. Oh, learn about the game referee, for God's sake. It makes him really good company. He's good fun. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. It's like, that's going to make a huge amount of difference to him. You know, you know, I feel we're like friends. I'd like to think that if he wrote a book about the experience, he might feel that he could say that we were friends now. <laughs> Whether that'll make it easier or more difficult, I don't know. But I think being able to call him a friend just might add a little spark, a little twinkle or something, I hope. There is something that is, it, it's sort of, it's just maddening. It's just one of those little tiny things. I think it's got to do with your top lip. But... My explosion of a moustache. I wonder if you'd have had one if none of this had happened. Well, at that time, everybody in the Welsh Guards had a moustache, even the women. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> what, what, are you, what do you actually sort of want to achieve now? Uh, I, I suppose I want to do more. 
of what? Everything. I have no desire to slow down or stop. As Del Boy said, you know, sleeping is for wimps. <laughs> Would you say you're a very restless person? I'm restless about doing things, about achievement. I'm very ambitious. And I, I see nothing wrong with that. And ambition. where does your ambition take you? I'll tell you when I'm 85. That's fine. I wonder, certainly observing you, what drives you, because you travel so much. I mean, how many businesses have you got going at the moment? At least, oh, right? I'm not sure. I mean, it's 10 or 12. Something There's something like, like that, yeah. I'm, I'm involved in, in a lot of things. The speaking is probably the most productive at the moment. When you're going out to talk to a group of people, to a group of school children, you appear very confident and you seem to have them in the small of your hand. You are the guys who are going to make the difference tomorrow. But do you have to work yourself up to that? I have to think about what I'm doing, yeah. I, I think the reason is for me is, is because it matters. When I got injured, the future looked very bleak. I don't well, like I'll, speaking I'll to people and being trite. I don't like speaking to people without having relevance and meaning to what I'm saying and to them. Don't let anybody dictate to you. Don't let anybody smash your dreams. Don't let anybody turn around and say to you, you're not worthy. Over the years, Simon has raised millions for different charities. Please accept this with our very grateful thanks for all the support. He's still a champion for causes close to his heart, like the Falklands Veterans Foundation. <laughs> Simon, for me, is the epitome of triumph against tragedy and somebody that's kind of almost risen from the ashes, reinvented himself and is now making a huge difference to a lot of people. I just can't settle for not trying something new. I can't settle for second best. I can't settle for not achieving. I like achievement. I like feeling, wow, look what we've done. Painting is taking shape. But Nikki still wants to add something that offers a clue to Simon's story. So tell me what there is left of your army kit. Um, I mean, I've got my medals. Um, but apart from that, I, I don't really have anything. Um... The thing is, I was thinking it might be nice to have some sort of reference to your days in the, hmm. in the Welsh Guards. After all, this all started because of it. Um, oh, yeah. I don't um, know if there was anything we could um, well, as always get hold the, of. The cap badge. Oh, you can get hold of a cap badge. That's fairly easy. And I don't want anything in an enormous amount of detail, but just a reference. Hmm. That's all. Um, it's going to be fairly simple. Well, I suppose it matches the name then, doesn't it? Simple Simon. <laughs> Nicky decides to feature Simon's military medals and his OBE in the portrait. I'd just like you to hold them. How, what's the easiest, like that? Is that the easiest the way easiest of holding them? Yeah. That's the most natural. Perfect. I don't want you to be going, look at these. I just want them to be there. I want that flash of red. The one from the, the OBE? Yeah. When did you get that? When she gave it to me. <laughs> Yeah, when was it? Uh, 90 something or other. And it was her, was it? Yeah, Not yeah. Was Did she say anything? Yeah, you go. Don't nick anything on the way out. <laughs> so, how long did she stand for you? I had three hours, and then in the middle she gave me an extra 20 minutes because she was only going to lunch. I never thought I'd get to paint her, to be honest. And I wasn't 100% certain 
whether it would be a good idea, you know, 